Hello again. Welcome to the Chapter 6 Cell Communication video section. We're going to wrap up the final uh, 20 minutes or so of uh, this chapter, and then uh, next time we'll move on to Chapter 7 and apply this cell communication in the endocrine system. To summarize what we've uh, covered so far in Chapter 6, we broke out the basic parameters of signaling, that is to say input, reception, transduction, and then some kind of effect. Uh, we even broke out the idea of electrical signaling, like in this neuron here. Uh, we talked about mechanical signaling just a little bit, and I will touch on that a little bit more. Uh, but primarily, we're concerned in this class and this chapter on chemical signaling. Uh, all three of these have similarities. We have some kind of an input signal, a receptor, some kind of an integration, and then a response and effect. That's true with electrical. That's certainly true with chemical and mechanical. One more thing that we tend to broke out a little bit, um, the different types of second messages that we see. For instance, this one right here is an example of some kind of a cascade, whether that's a kinase cascade or a proteolytic cascade. Uh, sometimes we can have second message chemicals that act as cofactors and modulators of proteins that are already there, that sort of fast cytosolic response or we can have something that we modify that then goes to the nucleus and mediates a slow genetic response. In either case, we see that again and again and again. It doesn't matter really what kind of signaling we're talking about. So here's our second message signaling. Again, just want to clarify, I did have a question in class. This second message here isn't just one copy. It may be thousands and thousands of copies. Uh, or, or particles that are modulators of proteins. And that's why you can have this sort of amplification effect. You can have a bunch of cofactors that amplify a bunch or activate a bunch of proteins that then cause all kinds of other metabolic responses or perhaps uh, genetic responses. That's the essence of a second message. It's the, it's the biochemical message inside the cell in response to a first message from outside the cell. Now we're into the new stuff. Let's talk about the different kinds of receptors. We've talked about the second messages. We've talked about the modes of signaling, electrical or chemical or physical. Now let's look at some cell membrane receptors. These guys are found in the plasma membrane and are primarily responsible for extracellular signals. Some of these things are gated for intracellular events. That's not, um, you know, it's not exclusive. But for our purposes, we're going to assume that the message, the first message is extracellular, and we're going to break through and discuss each of these types of different membrane receptors. The receptor channel, which we have talked about in the past, uh, the receptor enzyme, and what's called a G-protein coupled receptor, because it's coupled to this protein over here, which is part of the second message. And then lastly, an example of a, a, um, a mechanotype receptor slash receptor that interacts with the cytoskeleton. Not all these things are mechano. Some of these things are chemically uh, activated as well. Our first category that we'll discuss is the one that we've already discussed a little bit in, in Chapter 5, the idea of gated receptor channels. These channels are gated to the presence or absence of a chemical molecule. Now, in this figure right here, we have a channel that is closed in the absence of some extracellular first message. So once it the extracellular message arrives, binds appropriately with that uh, channel, it then will change configuration. And in this case, it's going to open and allow some kind of ion or some kind of molecule to move through. Again, relatively nonspecific. I say relatively. They can be specific. It's just not nearly like a carrier. This one, when we talk about channels, we're talking about uh, uh, spe specificity for size, or charge, usually a little bit of both, size and charge. So this one has been gated to an extracellular first message. Over here, this is a receptor channel, only this one's gated to an internal. This one's gated to a second message. 
What we will see later on in this chapter is that we see mechanisms linking. Like, for instance, maybe we have a G protein coupled receptor that causes a second message that causes this message to arise, and then this one causes a response. So, yes, this is a receptor channel, but oftentimes we see these sort of internally gated receptor channels as the effectors of the cell, as the, as the response in the cell, rather than the initial signal. So this is actually a, usually a second message that's triggering this one, whereas this one right here is a first message. But I wouldn't want you to think that we're solely in this realm. We see the same phenomenon, only this is an effector rather than an initial receptor. Here's one that's gated for even a different second message. This one is cyclic GMP. G and A are actually quite similar structurally. If we look at the nitrogenous base in those ribonucleotides, they are uh, very similar. Um, but again, this one's, this one's gated for GMP, and this one's gated to release potassium. Next category, receptor enzymes. These receptors, when activated, trigger some kind of enzymatic reaction. And you remember that last um, channel in the previous slide that I showed you? This one may be coupled with a channel like that. This receptor is activated. It starts creating cyclic GMP from GTP. And then that cyclic GMP diffuses over to a receptor channel that's gated for cyclic GMP. I don't have the picture here. I'm just imagining that picture from the previous slide. The most common type of receptor enzymes, and we talked about this in 165, we called them RTKs, receptor tyrosine kinases. So now you can understand, if you know what a kinase is, that the receptor gets activated by the message, and then it starts phosphorylating tyrosine residues on protein targets. Receptor tyrosine kinase. So the most common type of receptor enzymes catalyze the transfer of phosphate from ATP to a target to make a phosphorylated target. So here's our receptor tyrosine kinase. They are the first message. It causes a conformational shift. They dimerize. They phosphorylate each other. And then that allows them to in or act in interact, excuse me, interact with some target. Maybe we're going to phosphorylate that target, a receptor tyrosine kinase. The tyrosine means the amino acid that the receptor is phosphorylating. And so I have a little uh, animation here. I'll just let it play for a few seconds. You get that binding, like for instance, the first message, it binds and it causes a dimerization. You get a, a double uh, subunit. The binding of the, of, the, of the ligand changes the shape of the receptor to the point that then they will then associate non-covalently, quaternary structure. Once they dimerize, then they engage in kinase activity. They actually phosphorylate each other. So this guy right here is going to phosphorylate the tyrosines on the, this side. This guy right here is going to phosphorylate the tyrosines on the other side. I kind of like the analogy that we're opening the red carpet, where we're opening our arms to receive a hug or something along those lines. Those phosphorylation events actually cause the protein to open up and allow for additional non-covalent interaction with other targets. Just like when we say, put, put out the welcome mat, if you will. Our next category is probably the biggest black box for students. They're usually least familiar with uh, uh, this one. It's a, called a G-protein coupled receptor. It's really, really cool. And the reason it's cool is because this part is part of the second message. So here's an activated second message, and I'll get to that in a second. But now, instead of having to reinvent the whole signal cascade, Instead of having to reinvent the whole signal cascade, now all you have to do is swap out this, and you can cause similar responses in a cell to different ligands, different signals. It allows for changing this seven transmembrane thing 
into something different, but yet still interacts with the second message. Okay. It's sort of like you have one telephone over here, and then maybe we have a different kind of telephone, but both interface with the telephone signals that then send that telephone or text message or something down downstream. So that's why it's a G protein coupled receptor. You can recognize them from a mile away because you have this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven transmembrane uh, uh, si uh, signature. They used to call this a serpentine receptor because it goes through the membrane seven times. G-protein coupled receptors are enormously important in medicine. Turns out about two-thirds of all the drugs that we know and use, if you were to open up a physician's, uh, you know, physician desk reference, PDR, for drugs, and those things are about three or four inches thick. There's just tons, you know, thousands and thousands of different drugs. About two-thirds of those drugs are drugs that are designed to influence or inhibit G protein coupled receptors. And that's why we talk about them in here because they're enormously important pharmacologically. So once a GPCR binds its ligand, and they call that ligand an agonist here, that's a, just another phrase, an activator, it activates this, that causes this G protein to become active. It swaps out the GDP, so when it's in inactive form, it has GDP, and it swaps that out for an act, uh, GTP. So it releases the GDP, binds a GTP, and now this guy releases those, inner, those uh, inhibitory subunits and goes on and sends a signal. So what happens is that the receptor triggers a conformational shift, forces it to release the GDP, it binds GTP, and it releases these other inhibitors. These are inhibitory subunit proteins. And now this G protein can go out and do second message. So here's just another picture of the same thing. Again, you can spot that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You might see G protein listed down here, like G sub alpha, okay? Um, they don't have the G here, but this is the motif for a G protein, especially that seven. That's easy to spot. Another category, our last category, is called integrins. Integrins are interesting. They may be a combination of mechanoreceptor and or chemoreceptor. And it's hard to tell sometimes. It's a very, very close interface here. The key aspect of integrins is that they are plasma membrane receptors that then can act through cytoskeleton and occasionally uh, enzyme type situations. They, they allow for sensing of the extracellular environment and help tell a cell that it is in the right place. So it is a plasma membrane receptor for not only chemical signals, but also often uh, mechanical signals because it's interacting with the cytoskeleton leading to enzyme changes and second message. And these things can get really, really fun. Um, what I will tell you about this, and I'm not going to test you on this, but here we have this integrin that's binding to some kind of compound in the extracellular matrix interacting or cross-reacting in some way with a receptor tyrosine kinase. They activate proteins, we have some phosphorylated things. It can lead to a whole lot of different types of responses, all for similar or nuanced signaling. We're never just getting one signal. We're always getting a plethora of signals all the time. So how do we coordinate them all? That's through what we call crosstalk between these receptors. Now through the next series of slides, we are going to sort of play out examples of signaling pathways using different receptors, showing you a little bit of that crosstalk that I just mentioned in the previous slide, trying to apply the things that I have mentioned up to this point. And so our first signal pathway that we're going to game out here is a receptor channel. You can recognize it because it's got that channel configuration. It's got that ball and chain, which means it's a gated channel of some kind. And there's a little receptor symbol right here. So here's our first message. 
Our first message comes in, it binds and, and affects that ion channel and then can cause a change in the permeability of the plasma membrane to ions. Those ions could be second messages or they could be involved in something like membrane electrical charge that could be a response in and of itself. That's a lot of things, right? A lot of possibilities. But again, we have the binding. We have now changed the conformation here, changed permeability to that ion, and now the ions move in. Is it a second message? Depends on the signal. Is it a, is it a response? Depends on the signal. We can do a similar thing using second message in a G protein coupled receptor. Instead of it being a receptor channel, this is a G protein coupled receptor. And so we have another signal. That signal then affects the G protein and the G protein becomes the second message leading to a change in permeability of the membrane. So this receptor channel, this channel, I don't know if I call it a receptor channel, this channel is gated for the G protein. So when the G protein is activated, it comes over and affects this channel, and now we have affected membrane permeability. So it's an OR situation. Now these are two different signals, but both could mediate a similar response. This could be a sodium channel here. This could be another form of sodium channel. Now we have the basis for multiple similar responses to different signals. You know how I talked about different receptors could lead to different responses, that pleiotropy? Well, this is a, a situation where we might have a different signal, but yet we still have the same response, theoretically. It just depends on what this ion channel allows and what this one allows. In either case, what we are seeing here is first message, some receptor event, some intracellular second message of some kind, some cytosolic event leading to response. Maybe that G protein leads to cyclic AMP that then affects that channel. Maybe that cyclic AMP is going to affect some other proteins or both. Calcium might be released in some cases. Some of these ion channels aren't on the plasma membrane. Some of them are found on the endoplasmic reticulum or uh, other organelles that might release ions or allow ions to move. ATP, ADP ratios. So we're looking at things that control the controllers. If you remember in chapter, I think it was chapter three or chapter four, we talked about things like second message and ADP, ATP ratios affecting protein function. And there are others, I don't wanna to get too crazy here. I know that I'm, waxing a little bit, you know, I know it's getting complicated, but the key is to keep the pieces straight. These guys are protein modulators, and this is a protein, but it could be other proteins in the cell as well. Here's just another uh, example. Again, ion channels are our receptors in this case. We've got this receptor channel here. We've got this uh, channel over here that's uh, receptive to some second message. We get some change in permeability to, uh, in the membrane. Maybe this one lets sodiums in and this one lets potassiums out. It's possible. Maybe we create an electrical signal instead of a, a, you know, a, you know, some sort of a biochemical event. Could be a, a protein that's sensitive to that electrical signal that then leads to a response. We're going to see this in neurons. We're going to see this a little bit in muscle. This is a very important signal paradigm. What we've done, rather than create second message in the form of some sort of protein activity, what we've done is we've altered the voltage of the plasma membrane and the, and the proteins that are going to be the responders are in fact the ones that start getting activated because of that voltage shift. Again, stay tuned for this one. This one we're going to see, this pathway we're going to see in, in uh, especially in neurons and in, uh, in, in uh, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. This one here looks really, really complicated, but I will show you how to approach this. You have to kind of walk through it. 
in in a way, this is like one of those books where you get a pick, a, you get to choose a choice, and then when you choose a choice, it tells you to turn to the next page, and then you get another choice. That's what this picture is all about. So you walk through it step by step. So here's our first message. Here we have a membrane receptor, and it could be a receptor channel, it could be a receptor enzyme, it could be a G-protein receptor, receptor, or even an integrin, for that matter. Well, what happens in response to that change in conformation here? Maybe we activate a kinase cascade, and we phosphorylate proteins and get to a response. Or maybe we activate something that turns on an enzyme that creates a second message that then causes kinases or release of calcium. Or maybe we activate a second message and then cause our channel to open or close. This is showing you the realm of possibility. There is no one pathway here. So we could go down straight down this way. We could come this way through a second message over here. You could come this way, this way to, to, to activate calcium. That's contraction right there. That's calcium contraction. Okay. So, or we can do something else. It's all right here. This is like an everything pizza. Rather than just having cheese or just cheese and pepperoni, now we've added all the ingredients. So here's just an example of a second message. I used to have it pop up in there. If we create cyclic AMP, we're on our way. For reading purposes, please read carefully pages 171 through 173. You're going to start with the section that's titled Most Rapid Signal Pathways and Rapid Cytosolic Pathways up to the section but not including the many lipophilic. Okay. So it's a couple of pages or so. Read that carefully. Take good notes because that's really the essence of what this figure is trying to show you. It's putting all the pieces together. So we started with the pieces, talked about examples of the pieces, and now we're putting all of these pieces together. And 171 to 173 is trying to help you do that. Regardless of where you go or what you do, you're going to be involved in cell signaling. And it's always going to involve something like this. If you're dealing with somebody's muscle weakness, it will have to do with this. If you're dealing with someone's Parkinson's, it's going to have to do with this. You're dealing with endocrine disorders, same old story. What we're trying to do is give you the tools, not so that we can train you on every possible clinical situation, because that's not possible. There's many diff different clinical situations as 20 times the number of people that exist. It's not possible. So give you the basic tools of signaling in order to apply when we get to That's it for chapter six. Thank you for hanging with me today. I hope you found this uh, useful. As always, if you have any questions, come see me I, uh, office hours or uh, come on uh, study sessions uh, when we have the chance. Uh, I'd love to hear from you and uh, thank you for your time. Take care.